Good morning, Thursday 18th of March. Hope you're doing well. Uh, just before I begin, if you are watching this briefing delayed on our YouTube channel, don't forget to like and subscribe um, if you would like to see the private live session we did for the FOMC last night with the team uh, and myself, then just leave a comment on the video and I'll be happy to share that on Saturday at the weekend because I think it was a really good review of how to prepare and then with some of the guys how they're executing trades over a news driven event. So uh, as I said, if you like, subscribe, leave a comment, I'll be happy to um, share that at the weekend if that's of interest. But otherwise, look, let's get straight into it uh, and talk about this morning. And definitely it's a uh, kind of picking up the baton from where we left off. So generally speaking, uh, equity index futures are still higher. We had a positive close on Wall Street across the three major indices. And that reverberated then across then the global market, Asia generally higher, perhaps the Aussie market touched lower despite very good jobs data there locally. Um, dollar still weak and weakening at this point. Um, in terms of the actual intraday session at the moment, it's down about one tenth of a percent, but obviously got hammered yesterday on the back of the Fed. Uh, so both major currency pairs, Euro dollar and cable continuing to move higher. Euro dollar in close proximity now to retesting the initial aftermath high that we saw um, on the initial spike up on the Fed. Cable looking to reclaim 140, this coming irrespective of vaccine delay information that we heard from the NHS yesterday, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, gold still elevated, having broken out of that range, really firm move there and up 23 bucks having just grinded it out as well, adding to the US pop on the Fed in the Asia pack session. Uh, and then in terms of yields, relatively static there. So let's have a recap then of the Fed. What exactly did they do uh, and what has promoted this type of movement that I've just kind of talked through? So from a very top level, getting everyone up to speed, long story short, uh, the Fed done what we thought that they would do, what we discussed here yesterday in the briefing kind of materialized. And it was the idea then that people were really zoned in on the median dot plot for rates in 2023. Now, here then, what they basically said is that they stuck to their projections of near zero interest rates through, not in 2023. Uh, and that was the key trigger really for the markets. There were other things, of course, but that's what promoted that move, given the outside bets that there was going to be a potential uh, bringing in nearer time frame for the first rate hike from the Fed, which did not materialize. Um, our kind of view on this um, is that ultimately this isn't going to detract from the fact that yields are going to move higher in the foreseeable future in the months to come as the growth momentum picks up in the US to hit their targets of what they're looking for, which is around 6.5% in growth coming uh, in the period ahead. Yields inevitably will go up with that growth scenario. However, the market taking heed from the relief then that there's no kind of signs at this point of early tightening. And I don't think that was a surprise. I think the markets were just kind of misaligned with what they were looking for. Uh, and the reason for a lot of that, I think, was down to uh, the summary of, of, of projections. And you'll, you'll remember two days ago or so, I was talking about Goldman Sachs, who put out a note and they were talking about the fact that they saw actually around 11 members or so um, switching out to then bump the dot plot up, which would be this table here on the left hand side. And this is what the, comp the, the composition of the actual dot plot looked like in the actual um, projections last night on the right hand side. And as you can see here, only seven, nowhere near as many voting uh, for that more optimistic view uh, on the economy to subsequently lift rates. And so I think markets, uh, you know, Goldman's was really banging the drum on this. And I think people were getting a little bit overly excited uh, as we were kind of forecasting here on the desk that the idea here that we think given recent communication from the Fed, not just Powell, but everyone, that they weren't going to shift things at this point in time. And that's pretty much what he was echoing in the press conference that, look, we've always missed our inflation target. It's always undershot it. Uh, we haven't yet 
Um, it's very early to make those judgment calls about what it's going to be like in the future, albeit they see it higher, not wanting to pin down an actual figure as a threshold. Uh, and I think that type of language means that there, as he has said before many times, that despite the kind of yield tantrum um, movement and focus um, that the markets had in recent weeks for the Fed, they're just sticking to the plan at this point in time, not being bullied by the markets. And that's exactly you know, the, the stance that we, we would expect Powell to take. So um, all in all, I think it was more a little bit of a function of markets um, positioning rather than a shock event, uh, so to speak. Um, but definitely things still remaining um, you know, of a continuation of the trend for the moment going into the European Open. The Dixie has just, as I we're speaking now, gone below the low that was seen post-event last night. So both major currency pairs on the front foot at the moment uh, and definitely a dollar weakness story driving those, those dollar-based pairs for the time being. So definitely will be a theme to account for uh, in the session ahead. Here's what the actual projections look like. And yeah, for real GDP, then they do see um, real GDP. They've upgraded it uh, marginally, 0.2 for both 21 and 2022. Unemployment revised down, so positive there uh, with the quicker vaccination and the ability to reopen faster. And in the core PCE numbers, it was very marginal, only 0.1 increase on both 21 and 2022, which probably also assisted some of that, that move as well last night. Um, as I said then, overnight in Asia, it kind of followed through. Uh, we've got the BOJ later, we'll talk about that in a moment. There was some Aussie employment data. It was fantastic in fact, but really the Aussie not reacting a great deal, it being more driven by the weakening of the dollar. And Aussie, like with other dollar-based pairs, is rallying on the back of that. Uh, in fact, the Aussie has just broken out, just quickly flashing the, the Aussie into shot here. You can see the Aussie dollars just broken out of the double top from the Asia Pac session as Europe comes in and hits the dollar again uh, and a break through the R1 in the future. So fresh session highs here for the Aussie. Uh, but I guess um, underpinning that as well, helping the kind of divergence there short term being the good jobs data, but not much in the way of reaction to the actual numbers on their release. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was, was this. And, you know, one thing to be quite clear up front is the pound is rallying at the moment on the back of dollar weakness. And if anything, um, the actual pound is outperforming the euro on that basis. So this news, I think, is is not really um, being impactful for market sentiment on the UK on the roadmap or its general delivery. Perhaps the fact that the UK has got out in front with the speed of its vaccinations gives it a bit of wiggle room. Uh, if you remember when the UK issued their vaccination roadmap program a couple of weeks ago, um, the fact of the matter was that they were going to hit their targets well ahead of the actual fourth final step of reopening on the 21st of June. But they actually give, have given themselves a degree of wiggle room for exactly the issue of what we're seeing and confronted with now. And so getting you up to speed, the UK's vaccination program is has potentially been thrown a little bit off course as the NHS yesterday warned of a significant delay uh, and a reduction in supplies of jabs in order to freeze on new vaccination appointments in the month of April. Um, NHS staff were told that volumes for first doses will be significantly constrained uh, and the start of inoculations for the under 50s would be delayed. Uh, the BBC have reported it's understood the AstraZeneca vaccine supply issue relates to a consignment from a manufacturer in India, uh, half of the order has been delayed by four weeks. So yesterday, you know, this is kind of the state of where we're at at the moment. Politicians looking to protect themselves um, across the pond in mainland Europe, they're trying to point the finger. Astra is trying to protect itself. I mean, it's quite, it's quite um, uh, uninspiring to see, given the fact that we're facing a humanitarian crisis, to be quite frank. But that aside, um, you know, yesterday you had UK government politicians pointing the finger at, at Astra, saying it's, you know, it's there in a similar vein to Europe. It's their fault for not meeting the criteria of, of part of the supply agreement. Astra said that there's nothing wrong at the moment with the supply chain or their delivery schedule. Uh, and then it, it transpires that, you know, they're exactly right. You know, it isn't. It's just to do with uh, an issue which is always going to be that case. 
uh, given the fact that these drugs are manufactured all over the world and manufacturing, distribution, logistical issues are going to happen. Um, a large part, and this is a good point that was made by uh, Mike in our community on Amplify Live, he said the large part of the big ramp up in UK vaccine supply was made up of an acquisition of 10 million doses of Astra vaccine from the India contract manufacturer Serum. So in fact, it's around 10 million, it's pretty sizable, uh, coming out of that, that plant or facility in India. Um, so the point being here is half of that order is delayed, as the BBC have suggested, and that's leading to a slowdown of vaccinations, putting the UK government in a perhaps a slightly tricky situation. And the reason for that is that it has to cover its basis on second shots. Remember, UK government came out with that report a few months back saying that there's a perfect kind of 12 week window to administer the second shot after the first. And those people are coming due now, given those high risk categories that were taken care of first. Uh, and there's also probably going to be pressure uh, to preserve the Pfizer jabs. And the reason for that, of course, is that a lot of those are manufactured in mainland Europe. And at the moment, Europe are not playing ball and making some quite threatening noises via the EU Commission President uh, von der Leyen yesterday. Just to kind of go over that, um, von der Leyen said the bloc could activate Article 122, so 122 of the EU treaty, which allows it to take emergency measures to control the distribution of essential goods if severe difficulties arise in securing supplies. So basically just saying, right, we're gonna use EU, EU law, and part of the justification is that is that the UK is so far ahead in the vaccinations and most of the exports of European vaccines are going to the UK, right, you get the cut. <laughs> And so they're almost weaponizing that situation. Uh, again, I think a lot of that is political. Uh, I don't think it's perhaps gonna get quite to that point and that drastic, but you can see then the precarious nature that the UK is in because there's only so many different drugs out there. And if Astra delay is, is, is meaningful and leading to just Astra alone, which we're heavily geared to on as a composition, in our rollout of vaccines in the UK gets delayed by a sizable amount. They're having to take that action about um, freezing new vaccination appointments in April while they take care of second shots uh, being administered. You've then got the risk of Europe halting the Pfizer distribution and Moderna, who's due to supply a few hundred thousand doses in the first delivery next month. If the EU puts in place stricter export controls, that could also be hurt. And the problem with Moderna, of course, that we've known from the start, we're talking a few hundred thousand. With Astra and India, we're talking 10 million. Moderna has real difficulties in producing mass amounts given that it doesn't have the type of infrastructure that some of these bigger pharmaceutical companies have. All the meanwhile, over our friends across the pond, um, more positive, Joe Biden, the president, is basically poised to meet his goal of 100 million vaccinations in the first 100 days. He's going to hit it on day 58, it's looking at, so nearly half the amount of time. Uh, he's scheduled to speak publicly, actually, uh, later today. It's going to be this evening, London time, about the vaccinations. And he actually could well be in his right to double this target to 200 million in the first 100 days. And I just think the notion of under promising and over delivering is a fine thing in 2021 when it comes to politicians globally uh, it's, it's a rarity and so he really has um, stepped this up and in fact the pace of vaccinations in the us is at two and a half million per day and this is what that looks like in terms of the pace over january 1st to the current date of march 18th and it's anticipated to get faster Hence the reason why they can be very ambitious with those targets. So yeah, definitely tying this back in. This is a key component, of course, for the Fed and what the Fed are going to do because the economy is going to heat up. Even though the Fed are kind of holding off and being still ultra accommodative for now, that time will come and that communications challenge will need to be met at some point. And that some point is coming relatively soon probably going into May and then June FOMC meeting where we get the latest dot plots that's going to be then very telling because at that point they're probably going to want to give themselves at least a three to four month run-in of communication subtlety changes to then give the discussion about tapering before then tapering commences perhaps towards Q4 of this year. 
Um, so this is a key component to that, the vaccination story. The faster it happens, the more pressure there is then for the Fed to ultimately make a change at some point because the economy is going to pick up at this, a greater speed of reopening uh, and, and then increasing demand, inflation and so on. So that hopefully gives you a bit of context. But importantly, as I started that conversation, the pound isn't too fussed for those, those reasons I mentioned. Um, otherwise, bank decisions. We've got the Bank of England coming up. Now, the Bank of England, I would say, is probably the most boring of the Fed, the BOJ, and the BOE. So of the trio, this is probably the least inspiring for an intraday trader for price movement. Um, not expecting any change in interest rates and their asset purchase facility, uh, so their QE program. They're not going to follow the lead, if you like, of what we heard from the ECB last week. Um, if anything, I actually think that given the ECB's commitment to significantly increase their pace of purchases within their PEP program, and also what the Fed have been doing with being resistant to commenting on this kind of movement higher in yields uh, and getting the market kind of back into line with things, uh, with Fed thinking, I actually think the Bank of England have caught a bit of a break here and coming kind of after those banks comes with a little bit of upside that they've made their moves and the market's so kind of globally synchronised that they've already covered the bases, if you like, and, and the Bank of England could just sit back and, and, and just put it in cruise control for now, I think, that no need to rock the boat. So language is key here, I think, for the Bank of England. Uh, as they said here in Bloomberg, tone and guidance are key to, in the decision to make no change. So just looking out for some of the surrounding commentary around it, but not expecting a great deal. The BOJ, on the other hand, a little bit more interesting. And that's because they've just got, a, uh, they've got this policy review that they've been working on. And they're due to make some potential tweaks to the variety of tools in which that they use. Uh, the bank, according to a Reuters survey, will scrap either or both of the numerical guidelines set for its purchases of ETFs um, to make its stimulus program basically more sustainable. So this is about doing more, increasing flexibility here in a similar vein to a more dovish stance. The BOJ currently sets two guidelines for its ETF buying, which is to buy an annual pace of roughly 6 trillion yen, but up to 12 trillion. Critics argue numerical guidelines prevents the BOJ from buying ETFs in a flexible format, such as slowing purchases significantly when stock prices are booming. So just having a little bit more agility to react to, to market conditions. The central bank, secondly, the other big thing to look out for is expected to slightly widen an implicit band at which it allows long-term interest rates to move around its 0% target, according to the Nikkei press overnight. Uh, and that's one that's, that's, that's been talked about quite a lot as well. So that kind of yield curve control flexibility. Uh, but we'll have the answers to this. Obviously, this is coming out overnight uh, if you're looking at London time. So I'll talk about this more tomorrow morning when we have more details. Um, otherwise, for the calendar today, um, very quiet in the UK European morning. BOE then at 12 o'clock. Um, no press conference this time round from them. Next one of that's not due till May. Uh, you've then got the weekly jobless claims coming out of the States, expected at 700,000. Remember, they printed at 712 last week. So we are looking for a further improvement here, the number to go lower. Uh, and that comes in the context of 712 last week being the lowest reading we've had since the first week of November. So it was a particularly strong figure then uh, and looking for these improvements. Philly Fed business index coming out at the same time. So remember 12.30 rather than regular 1.30 with the clock change in the US. Uh, and that's pretty much it on the data side. Speakers though, Christine Lagarde speaks twice today um, at 8 and at 11. But speaking at a parliamentary hearing, introductory marks first and in a uh, women rights event second. Equally, Bank of England's Cunliffe is speaking at 11 with chief economist of the BOE Haldane speaking at 12.30, again, both off topic, talking about payment systems and an annual uh, women in banking event for Haldane. So of all of these uh, speeches, these are meaningful people talking, uh, but also layer in the context of the BOE uh, rate decision happening. Those BOE guys, BOE guys are not going to say anything specific on economy or policy, I would think. Uh, and I don't think we're going to get much out of the guard, given the fact that we heard the official communication from the meeting last week. 
Um, all right, that is it. Going to leave it there. As I said, quite a lot uh, to go over there. So hopefully it all made sense. Any questions at all, just feel free to leave a comment if you're watching this on YouTube. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button as well. We really appreciate you being a part of our community. And for the rest of the guys at Fire Life, I'll see you in the Discord room. All right, have a good day.